Hey boss, are you getting our weekly brood email filled with the latest news on the topics of money, marketing, and productivity? If not, you got to sign up. It is a boss favorite with industry smashing stats to prove it. It's here to keep you up to date with what's going on around the world to help you make decisions in your business. Now, if you are getting brood, I'm here to tell you that our new brood referral program is here to reward you for sharing this epic newsletter with digital downloads and merch like stickers and mugs to high five you for helping your friends be more boss too. Learn more and sign up for both our weekly brood email and the referral program at beingboss.club slash brood. That's beingboss.club slash B-R-E-W-E-D. Welcome to Being Boss, a podcast for creatives, business owners, and entrepreneurs who want to take control of their work and live life on their own terms. I'm your host, Emily Thompson, and today I'm joined by Kathleen Shannon for a conversation about the state of creating content, diving into the pros and cons of content creation, and how it has evolved with a touch on current events. You can find all the tools, books, and links we reference on the show notes at www.beingboss.club. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the show and share us with a friend. Want to build a more streamlined business, but want to do it in quick spurts of actionable info? Then you've got to check out I Digress, a show hosted by Troy Sandage, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. With shows under 30 minutes, I Digress helps eliminate complexity, complications, and confusion in your business with frameworks and strategies to achieve scalable and sustainable success, and does so with episodes like How to Attract Your Ideal Customer in an Oversaturated Market, and Hourly Rates versus Project Pricing, Charge for Value for Results instead of Time. Learn more and listen to I Digress wherever you get your podcasts. Kathleen Shannon is the partner and creative director at Braid Creative, a branding agency she co-founded with her sister 10 years ago. Kathleen is passionate about cohesive and articulate brands that reflect who you are, what you do, and attract your dreamiest customer. Kathleen is also the co-founder and former co-host of this show, Being Boss. And for those of you who are new here, you can find her accompanying me for the first 239 episodes of the Being Boss podcast with a couple peppered in since then. Oh my God, Kathleen, are you ready to do this? I'm ready. Can I describe my outfit first? Please do, because it's adorable. I am wearing a velour tracksuit. It's all brown, (laughs) matchy, matchy. Yep. With a camel colored oversized beret and a gold necklace. It's so cute. I feel very like Tony Soprano meets Paris Hilton meets Holly Golightly. It's adorable. I didn't realize that that was a whole tracksuit. That's that makes this all even better. Oh my god, you're scanning and showing it to me. Yes, ma'am. I love it. I love your outfit. Thank you. Let's talk about what we're talking about today, which I know is your favorite thing to do. Talk. It's not everyone. Just so you know, Kathleen hates talking about what she's going to talk about. But um, a couple of weeks ago, some things happened in the news. And we were on Marco Polo and Kathleen was like, I'm so glad I don't have to talk about this. Can I come on the podcast and talk about this? So here we are. You ready to dive in? Here we are talking about Joe Rogan. Just a little bit. We're talking about more than just Joe Rogan. We're going to be talking about content creation. We're going to be talking about publishing your work. We're going to be talking about when you're the product versus being the creator. We're going to be talking about platforms and advertising. It is going to be a whole, I do like talking about what I'm going to talk about (laughs) because I'm not entirely sure where we're going with this conversation. So I just want to caveat here that this is very much a working out what we're thinking, real-time conversation with some background of experience and thoughts and insights and opinions because you know we've got them. Indeed. I'm excited to dive into this one and I'm really excited. I feel like we're just like opening a can of worms and we're just going to like see what happens. (laughs) Just see what happens. Um, So we are going to start a little bit about Joe Rogan. This is not going to be a whole episode about this, but I think it is important to give the context of 
this, um, this one sort of piece of thing happening in the world and sort of give our take on it and how it how it plays into this bigger picture, because I I even want to look at this in terms of like a state of content creation. How have things evolved in this world? Because they have evolved. And really, what does it mean for you all as as business owners in a world who, you know, is being told that content creation on the internet is going to make you a millionaire <laughs> or whatever it is that you're being told. So you can make some good decisions and and move forward with your efforts in a way that feels aligned and has you prepared for the world that is content creation. Kathleen and I have been in this world for how many years, Kathleen? Well, I mean, I had a live journal like in the late 1990s. <laughs> Indeed, so. it's ditto, ditto. So let's say that long. <laughs> but I think that we were, you know, in that first wave of blogging back in 2008. Yeah. Is that really kind of when it was? Yeah. So almost 15 years, years ago, right? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Sit with that one for a second, Kathleen. So we've been here, we've watched this thing sort of happen and develop. And this thing is like, is content creation, right? How it started from these like sweet little roots back in the day and has turned into a thing that is making national headlines that is causing such a ruckus that is like, you know, affecting stock prices. And it's nuts to think about. Well, how dare mainstream media underestimate us from the beginning? <laughs> Let Indeed. that be the lesson. Indeed. So let's let's begin with let's begin with the thing that that sort of started this conversation, Joe Rogan and everything that's happened as of like February 2022. Um but I will say that I've been watching this Joe Rogan thing for years. I have been bitching about this Joe Rogan thing for years. And really, in particular, um, Spotify taking him exclusive and really what that meant for the podcasting industry in general. I mean, I don't really give two shits about Joe Rogan. I've never listened to a full episode. I probably never will. So this is not me really slamming his content as like a first person listener. Um, but it is some concern as someone who makes a living in this industry and seeing how the industry was changing and unsure, unsure what that was going to mean for everything. Um, so I've been watching it for a while. And it's been really interesting to see what has shaken out over the past couple of weeks and months, because y'all, I saw it coming. <laughs> <laughs> you did see it coming. I remember you being alarmed whenever Spotify did this exclusive deal. And you have always had this like finger on the pulse psychic ability to see what's coming next in content creation. We started being boss whenever you pitched it as an idea without I don't even think you had ever listened to a podcast <laughs> at the time. But I had been listening to Serial and I was like, yes, let's do it. I want a podcast. It was still in the newbie stages of it, right? However, I did listen to Joe Rogan. And so I thought I'd share a little bit about the timeline of Joe Rogan, just to give everyone a quick overview. If you want more details on this, I highly suggest listening to the Daily's NPR episode on Joe Rogan. I can send you a link if you want to include it in the show notes. It'll be there. But basically, here's the background. Joe Rogan started his show in 2003. So kind of like Mark Marin and those guys who've been doing podcasting before we even had the word podcasting, I think that he had a show before then. But it was super fringe. He was talking to MMA fighters, UFC fighters, and comedians. Now, interestingly enough, I used to train with a bunch of MMA fighters. So, and I've always been really into comedy, right? Stand up comedy. So, there was this interesting intersection where he was podcasting on stuff that I was interested in. Not that I was interested in fighting necessarily, but some of my acquaintances were literally on his show and are still on his show from time to time. So, I have, in fact, listened to episodes. Um, Probably starting in around 2009 and 2000. No, probably I wasn't even listening to him until about 2013, which is whenever he started his YouTube show. So he's been having a show since 2003. In 2013, he moves to YouTube, which is also kind of in its infancy, right, as like a platform. 
And it's super long form. It's not edited, but he has really reputable guests like Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of our favorites. And he's talking about things like diet and supplements and working out and psychedelics and drugs. So like with comedians, it's the perfect (laughs) intersection of all the things I want to listen to and hear about while I'm working out. So by about 2015, he has 11 million listeners per episode. So that's a lot. And just by context, Being Boss has like, I think, 11 million listens in all over the seven years that we've been here. Right? Like that, that is the difference here of like, We've been around for a long time. We have a top 0.1% show in all of podcasts. And we've had 11 million over the course of our lifetime. He's having 11 million (laughs) listeners per episode. Just hold that in your noggin for a sec. So in May of 2020, Spotify creates an exclusive deal with Joe Rogan. This was a big deal. And I cannot believe that that was after the pandemic started in March of 2020. So it was May of 2020. It was right around the time that I was leaving Being Boss. And at the time that I was leaving Being Boss, there were a lot of opportunities, you know? And so this is interesting to think about it in the context of how we were creating content. And we were having a lot of opportunities come up, like exclusive deals with either Spark partners or sponsors or platforms. I think that we even talked about, like, what would we do if we had an exclusive deal with Spotify even before this ever happened? Or an exclusive deal with somebody, right? Um, There's that other podcasting platform. What's it called? Um. What's his face? That British comedian is on there. Luminary. I think it's called Luminary. Yeah. There's a couple. Luminary, Wondery. I don't know if they're exclusive. I know there was some talk about that. Wondery is on all of the. So this is is interesting to know. Like Wondery, for example, is a podcasting group, Mm -hmm. but they're distributed on all of the different platforms like Spotify and they're just basically like an advertising network is what it is, is that Wondery coordinates the advertising to go on the shows and the contents. And of course, with stuff like Wondery, there is kind of a brand umbrella where if you're listening to a Wondery show, you can expect X, Y, and Z, right? So I d- anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself because I do like podcasting groups like that, that kind of curate stuff. So for example, I wanted Being Boss to be that a little bit. Like what if we had a group of shows under the Being Boss umbrella I even thought about it more recently. Like, what if I started podcasting again and had a show under the Being Boss umbrella, right? It could still happen. Maybe it could not. But that's down the line. (laughs) I don't want to get ahead of myself. Back to Joe Rogan. So Joe Rogan gets acquired by Spotify. This is whenever it rings the alarm for Emily. Emily's like, what is happening here? What is happening? Why did that like why did that ring the alarm for um, you? Why was that concerning for you? Because for me at the time I was like, whatever, who cares? The biggest thing for me was I, I've never been a huge fan of mm, Spotify's advertising model. And I'll just maybe kind of leave it at that and just all the tracking that's happening. Um And just I've heard things about some of their business practices and things that I'm just not a huge fan. And so hearing that Spotify was getting in my industry was like, oh, shit. And like with such a big play, such a massive play, because at the time the deal was happening, um, it was, you know, theories that it was between a hundred and two hundred million dollar deal. Um, I think over the course of the past two years, a hundred has become the most like commonly touted, um, sort of place where that deal landed. But I recently read something that like 200 and over is really where that deal was. And I knew that if they were doing something like that, and for someone like that, then I, I something smelled fishy. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but it was definitely ringing some bells for me. And and a, a, a big thing that was coming up for me is what is this going to mean for indie podcasters? Like if everyone starts putting themselves behind paywalls. And these paywalls are like massive paywalls like Spotify. What does it do for those of us who are just trying to show up and create content? How is this going to completely shake up our industry? You know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of doping in the Olympics or doping even in fighting. So like there's different rules 
even in MMA, on whether or not you can use performance enhancing drugs. And it's like, how do you compete if you're yeah. not also on testosterone or these, you know, other performance yeah. enhancing drugs? How do you compete against the people who are? And so it is like that for the indie podcasters where we're just trying to show up and do our thing. How do we compete against these huge deals? Yeah. If they become the norm yeah. or the standard. For sure. For sure. And for who it was. <laughs> it was like, like you could have chosen anybody in the world and you're going to choose Joe Rogan. Like, okay. Well, see, and it's funny because at the time I was probably still listening to an episode here or there. So I, you know, in my circles, it was the standard. It was kind of the norm. Yeah. So it didn't seem like that big of a deal, I guess. Because I was like, yeah, doesn't everyone listen to him? Like, it just seems like... Oprah getting a show on ABC. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like to me, it just kind of felt a little bit like that. Listen, my stance on Joe Rogan has changed since the pandemic. <laughs> Basically, fuck that dude. Don't like him. Don't care about him. People who listen to him call everyone else sheep. So whenever, in fact, they are sheeps to Joe Rogan. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got to say about that. But so basically, here's what's come out with the drama since the pandemic is that Rogan, who kind of takes some anti-vax views, has this controversial doctor who is anti-vax on his podcast, and he lends credibility to the anti-vax movement because he's a doctor, right? And to so millions and millions of people. This is not like some millions, like small indie million. podcast who has, you know, 20,000 downloads or whatever, which is still actually a big indie podcast. Um, right. But it's not like that. It's just like speaking to the masses. Right. Like, I think that probably Joe... Rogan was responsible for the whole ivermectin conversation <laughs> of like taking horse pills to get rid of COVID. Anyway, I want to talk too much about that. But basically, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell, who probably a lot of Joe Rogan listeners have never even heard of, are like, we're pulling our music from Spotify. You did a really great um, Being Boss newsletter mm -hmm. about Joe Rogan. It was so good. Be sure to read that, you all, if you haven't. Can you include a link in that yes, to that in the show notes? It will notes? be okay, in the show notes. a link to that. Um, Brene Brown, our our friend Brene, responds and is like, I'm pausing my podcast until I have more information. You know, and it's just real interesting, like, what's going down. Um, then I think that really the next level of it is whenever India R.E. India R.E. calls out Joe Rogan. Um, and says that she's also pulling her music from Spotify, but not because of the anti-vax stuff, but because there is this compilation of Joe Rogan using the N-word and saying some homophobic, transphobic, like just some awful garbage stuff, right? And that's whenever, like for a lot of people, it was the nail in the coffin, right? So not cool, not a good guy. And wait, this for me, though, was one of those things where like Spotify had had this in their pocket. You there know, you because overnight there's like, uh, you know, I start seeing headlines that Spotify has removed like 77 episodes, like out of hundreds, you knew exactly which 77 had these words in it, didn't you? Unless, of course, they have like, you know, transcriptions and robots and things, which is likely also the case. But I also think it's very likely that if they did their due diligence before giving this man $200 million, they probably listened to every single episode and flagged each one as problematic so that if and when a problem arises, oh, it'll be easy for us to quietly take these down overnight. That is the issue here. So Spotify chose their choice. Yeah. And they choose not only to give this dude a hundred million dollar deal, they choose not to cancel him. Meanwhile, claiming neutrality, I just don't know how you can claim to be neutral whenever you're also giving someone a hundred million dollars. That's not neutral. <laughs> Two, 200 plus between a hundred and 250, I imagine. Right. But like, here's a couple of things. One, I don't know what Spotify should do at all. Like I have same, I have, same. I have no recommendations to Spotify. Like you made your bed. <laughs> When you it's made also this above deal. my pay grade. Yes. Like, that's where I was, like, so grateful that I don't have to think about it, right? Yep. Like, I'm not making decisions for Spotify, yep. nor do I have the bandwidth to think about what they should and do, I, because I don't care. I wouldn't have made this decision in the first place. But exactly. a couple, like, one, not for, like, censoring those sort, like, not for that. 
Love some First Amendment. Obviously, I'm here talking my smack all the time, though my smack is not actually shared here on this podcast, which is another conversation altogether. Um, yeah, because you hold yourself accountable to your values and your mission. Indeed. And I feel like that's where the issue is here. Yes, that is absolutely where the issue is. Well, that's where one of the many issues is. Um, so I don't think that they should necessarily, like, I don't think they should censor what he is saying i don't even know that they should like necessarily deplatform him though that's what i'm definitely more for than anything um one of the things that i sort of brought to you as we were having this conversation via marco polo a couple of weeks ago is one of the things that no one's really considering about you know these calls to deplatform him and take him off spotify and you know sort of let him back loose in the world because that's exactly what it would do if spotify canceled the deal is that you can actually look at the search engine optimization data around Joe Rogan and see that whenever he went behind the Spotify paywall, his influence literally decreased by half. And by that, what I mean is people started or people were searching for Joe Rogan on Google half as often as they were whenever he was just open for everyone to listen to. So it's literally probably better for the world if he is behind that Spotify paywall. Because then not just everybody can go listen to the nonsense that he and his guests are potentially, allegedly, spouting. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting to note because Spotify is still free. So what if people are Googling Spotify? You know, I don't know that the Google SEO necessarily reflects his impact. It it does. It does. To At the volume at which it is happening, I think it absolutely does. Right. And even if I'm looking at, you know, Joe Rogan, Spotify, like that search volume is so tiny that like those words together aren't making any difference. Like he is literally less accessible, very legitimately right. behind Spotify than he is when he is openly podcasting on all of the platforms and on YouTube. HubSpot's CRM platform can help you kickstart your sales process, increase your leads, and stay connected with customers. Plus, it will scale with your business, making HubSpot the perfect tool for any creative business owner. Hear it from a real boss using HubSpot to grow their business. My name is Laura DeFranco. I'm the founder of Free Period Press, a Being Boss podcast fan and HubSpot CRM customer. It's really important to have a pulse on what's going on with our retail customers. I want to know how their customers are responding to our product, our prices, and what trends they're seeing in their shops. Even though we're working digitally, we're trying to keep our relationships as human as possible by developing real connections with store owners. We use HubSpot to track all of our wholesale accounts and prospects. We're honestly just scratching the surface in HubSpot's capabilities, but it's really nice to know that we're set up in a system that has the features we'll need as we grow. We track the contact information for all of our wholesale stockists and leads in HubSpot. There's so much data that we can add for each stockist, not just email and address, but any personal notes, the last time they ordered, or special requirements. When it's time to reach out to our accounts, we can filter so that we're sending more personalized messages to each store, and that is super helpful. My HubSpot CRM platform helps my business stay connected. Learn more about how it can do the same for yours at HubSpot.com. So then what's interesting about this is, you know, is the issue really Joe Rogan or is it about how we're creating content, how we're publishing our content, how we're distributing our content, how we're gatekeeping our content and how we are being compensated for our content? Yeah, I think it's I think it's I think the problem is that content creation like just got caught doing drugs. (laughs) You know, just got caught making a bad decision. Like we never would have done drugs as kids <laughs> when we were just like blogging well, back in the speak day. For yourself, <laughs> I think it's also that like you know, content creation has become this unregulated orgy of that's not you know like there's no rules. Mm, there's right yeah. where, where there are rules and boundaries. It's created by people like Spotify. Like they're creating the rules and. <sighs> How much do we rely on them to tell us what's acceptable and what isn't? Mm. And where do we have influence over what's acceptable and what isn't? So it kind of reminds me of after this Joe Rogan thing, I saw a lot of people boycotting Spotify 
And selfishly, I was like, I've spent years curating these playlists. And listen, I am all for a solid boycott. I haven't eaten at Chick-fil-A to my own detriment (laughs) for years because those chicken nuggets are the best. But right? Like, we're still boycotting Chick-fil-A, right? Like, I... Anyway, and this is an issue that's come up with a lot of things over the past few years as we become more aligned with companies that reflect our values. Like, I'm I'm cool with wearing Nike because of their support for Colin Kaepernick, right? Like, there are certain things where I'm like, yes, that is a brand that I'm willing to support and share on my body um, because I do like their values. And it is something that we have to think about. But it also reminds me of the call to stop using straws to save the environment whenever you not using a straw is not going to do, it's really not doing anything it's a symbol more than anything and i don't drink out of sometimes i do i don't <laughs> use plastic water bottles i don't use single use plastic as much as possible really more as a symbol than anything and as a as a almost like not ritual but this thing that represents my care for the earth, right? But then I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to do other things like make bigger changes or at least thinking that my little impact is adding up with everyone else's little impact. When in fact, the people that could have the greatest impact are the people who are causing all the pollution. So it could be that, you know, corporations like Amazon, Apple, and Spotify have a bigger impact on the environment than me not drinking out of a straw, right? And then policymakers, policymakers could make it illegal to pollute, right? Or do whatever they do using their own expertise and wisdom to make bigger change. So that's kind of how I feel about the Spotify boycott. Like boycott them if you want to or not. I actually don't have opinions. I yeah. I, I don't want to have an opinion. Whatever though, makes what you I'm feel better about the situation, 100%. Exactly. Whatever makes you feel better. Because I don't think any of those things are really going to make huge impacts either. He's still going to be there. And is that the worst thing? I don't know. Um, but it it has had us thinking a whole lot about what this means for sort of, one, how we got here. <laughs> like how we got from like everyone just wanting to blog about their food back in the day to now we have people making multi-million plus deals. There's a siren. I like the siren. It okay. makes it real. <laughs> we are podcasting in the real world where emergencies happen. They do happen. Um, so where people are making or getting these ridiculous deals, conflict is causing drops in stock prices. Like all it like, how did we get here? How did we get from cute little beginnings of content creation, the internet to this and what happens next? Because we have to learn from our mistakes. Hopefully Spotify is Joe Rogan is probably not. Um, I think that and like, but like we can also we can learn from this. And one of the things that I really took away from this whole scenario is, well, sort of actually, there's a thing that I took from it, but there's this other view of it. And one is, especially those of us who are active on Instagram, or at least have been within the past five years, we have developed this belief that all institutions should be for good, that every corporation in the world should have some positive impact mission. And that's adorable, but that's not necessarily the case. And we have sort of built this into our expectation of companies in a way that like, that just has us really mad about everything, everything. And I think we should be in most cases, but I think that we need to sort of disconnect this, um, maybe not disconnect, but just realize that not every decision a corporation like Spotify is going to make is for good. That's not why they're here. No, it's for profit. Yeah. And I think that what I also see along those lines is a sense of entitlement and ownership. 
Just because you have a feed on Instagram does not mean that you own that feed. And we've been talking about this for years. And it's always going to be this way. If you are publishing on someone else's platform that is not your own, you do not own that. You rent it. Yeah. And Instagram is doing things and like Facebook and Spotify and like every, every business that we all sort of engage with on our daily is making questionable decisions somewhere. And in fact, many of them have no real for good impact outlined in their bylaws at all. And they're fine with that. Is that good and preferred? No. But like, that is also the reality of it. And so I think that's where the decision comes of like, you know, change your stuff or leave and like, you need to make the choice for yourself. And to some extent, um, I don't know, go find a cause that's easier to fight. (laughs) Maybe. It's also kind of, it feels a little bit like a, like a scale, you know, like a pros and cons. It feels a lot like parenting where there's (laughs) never a good choice. You're never going to make the good choice, but you can make the best choice, right? So for example, with the Spotify thing, I felt kind of guilty for not boycotting it because I don't want to lose my years of curated playlists, but also because I want easy access to podcasts like Brene Brown and Armchair Expert, where they are devoted to, you know, especially Brene, causes like Black Lives Matter and social justice and climate and all of the things doing good in the world. Yes. Armchair Expert having conversations about mental health and They're just fun to listen to. And so I do still listen to those podcasts. I hit follow and subscribe within Spotify to those podcasts, not to Joe Rogan's. So what does that mean? What does that say? And just kind of choosing my choice there. Exactly. So that was sort of that's that is my takeaway. Like on one side, there's this reality that these big corporations don't give a shit, y'all. Like, and I think if you are still here thinking they should and that they will, like you're wasting your time. (laughs) think on so, to some and extent your energy you're wasting your energy for sure but what you can do and what i absolutely expect everyone to do who is listening to this podcast wanting to you know be boss of your work and life is for you to do better because i do think that when all of us stop drinking with our plastic straws <laughs> as it may be, we can collectively make an impact, which is why whenever I am here, I am creating and sharing content through the lens of my values that I will hold true. Does Joe Rogan have values? I'd be interested to know what they are. (laughs) I bet he'd be interested to know what they are. Um, But I do know that I have them. And I know that this brand has them. And this is the way that I want to show up and create content and fill the world of podcasts And just general online content creation with the kind of soul-centered, impactful, do no harm to anybody kind of stuff that I want you to listen to and that I want to listen to as well. So that's really what I took away from, or one of the big things that I took away from this whole scenario is that like Joe Rogan's been around so long that he can just say what he wants. I never want to be in that place. I Even if I am here 20, 30 years, I still want to operate through the lens of values, one of which is doing no harm. And so if I can do that, I want to instill it to you listening to do that as you are navigating the world of content creation, whether that is on your blog or on your Instagram or in your podcast or on your newsletter, filter yourself, edit yourself, make sure like your points of view have been sent through multiple different lenses for it to come out on the other side in a way that you actually feel good about. You never have to go back at some point and be like, oh, We should probably delete those 77 episodes. But you know what? We have. We've made mistakes. We have said things that might be tone deaf or off base because we didn't know better. Here's the difference. Mm. Yeah. Here's the difference is that our intention – I've heard this like intention or impact over intention, which sometimes I grapple with because I think that our intention has always been to – for example, do no harm. And then whenever our impact has not reflected that value or that intention, guess what? Our community calls us in 
and they say, hey, you said this thing. It was a little bit insensitive, um, whether it was like ableist or whatever. And then guess what? We learned better and we did better afterwards. So that's the big difference is that we didn't make a half-assed apology. We were like, oh, dang, didn't know that. And so this is to say, whenever you are creating content, you will make mistakes along the way. You will, whether it's just looking back at old posts and cringing because you were an awful writer, which I have done with my previous blog posts, or accidentally saying something. Like, I think that even Brene Brown, um, she mentioned this recently, having said spirit animal. She called, I think she called Mark Duplass her spirit animal in one of her interviews. And her community was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, you can't say that. That's insensitive. And she was like, whoa, I didn't know. Right. But she didn't get canceled because guess what? Her intention and her impact is greater than her mistakes. So just make your intention, your values greater than the mistakes that you'll make along the way and you'll be okay. Because I think that whenever you try and be perfect, it paralyzes you and keeps you from showing up at all. And we believe in creating content. We believe that content is a great place to, again, engage with your community, to share your expertise and insights and experience and to make your own difference in your own little corner of the world. Yeah, absolutely. All of those things, because this is a platform that we obviously still believe in a hundred percent one way or the other, whether it's podcasting or Instagram or blogging or TikTok (laughs) or or any, or any of the platforms, creating content and showing up in this way. It's as I was sort of building out some of my thoughts. One of the things that I put in here is that one of the things that you started braid around was the idea of capturing, shaping and sharing content. Yep. And how that that literally has fed into everything that you've done for the past decade. I love that you say that because I'm always thinking about that whenever it comes to what I'm creating and what I'm sharing. So that has been one of the backbones of, or, you know, almost like my own personal pillars. I wouldn't necessarily call it a value, but it is kind of pillars or a filter for how I show up. So I like to capture, shape, and share because how we're showing up on Instagram, how we're showing up on this podcast, how we're showing up anywhere is not the full story. You're never going to see all of someone's life or all of their experience. So you have to decide what you're going to capture. So that's kind of this curating process. I mean, you have to think about how you're going to shape it. So forming it into- How you're going to edit it. (laughs) How you're going to edit it. Yeah. So yeah, kind of forming the thoughts around it. And this is also why I love podcasting because it is, in fact, whenever I think about the transcript of this, I get freaked out because (laughs) it's not going to read the same on paper as it sounds coming out of our mouths. That's what I love about podcasting is that there is some nuance. There is some grappling with issues. There is just a lot more conversation and exchange around ideas. That's what's really fun about it. But that's also what can be a little bit dangerous about it. So anyway, capturing, shaping. We learned early on in shaping the podcast that who we have on as guests matters to our brand, you know? And so this, again, also goes back to making sure that your values align with the stuff that you buy, where you put your dollars, you know? And for me, that's why I pay for stuff like Hulu and YouTube so that I don't have to see advertising. Not that I think that all advertising is bad. I allow some people to track me and to advertise to me because I like what they have to offer, right? Anyway, and then sharing, you know, and and sharing is, sharing is a value of mine. Like putting ourselves out here, we only live once, we're all going to die. We might as well show up as we are with who we are so we can make the world a better place while we're here. Right. And that's funnily, I feel like that's one of the biggest evolutionary things that I want to sort of poke at with content creation is how the like that lens of authenticity was like clear and then completely opaque. <laughs> I feel like for a hot minute of like especially sort of those Instagram prime years, but how it is becoming more important for content now, where I feel like we went through a couple of years where, you know, 
let's edit this as much as we possibly can. Airbrushes everywhere, styling everything, um, really making sure that everything we share is perfection um, for the internet to just turn around and be like, actually, that's fake. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clean things up and get back to being authentic, which is something that I talked about with um, with Andrea Jones in an episode earlier this year. We'll include notes to that and or links to that in the show notes around one of the things that's really sort of working right now in social media is this return to like sincere authenticity. You can scroll through TikTok and nobody's got their makeup on, <laughs> and I love that for them. Right. Or um, or even I think she touted at the time and I've seen this a whole lot as well is Twitter threads right now are just running rampant. It's not, you know, however many characters a single tweet is anymore. It's as many as you want to pile into a thread as you possibly can. It's going deeper. It's being more authentic. Um, And I love that. I love that we've sort of I guess I love that we experienced that because we needed to so that we could turn around and get back to being super authentic. As bosses, we know the importance of testimonials, right? It's what helps your customers decide to buy you over your competition. And I know it helps you discern where to put your money too. So when it comes to deciding what move to make and how you manage the money side of your business, let me just say that FreshBooks, the easy to use accounting software designed specifically with small businesses in mind, has had over 24 million users, has 4.5 out of five stars on GitApp, and has been a favorite tool for bosses for over seven years, which means something very important. Small business owners like you really love using it, and it might be just the solution you're looking for to invoice your customers, track your expenses, and manage your books. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days, no credit card required. Go to freshbooks.com slash beanboss to get started today. Yeah, so you know I love me some Kardashians, right? I know. Sincerely. (laughs) I sincerely love me some Kardashians. And one thing that I've noticed is, you know, if you look at Kylie's feed versus Courtney, who's like Courtney's one of my favorites, Mm -hmm. there's a stark difference. And so Kylie is of that highly curated, highly edited, you'll never see her without makeup, to Courtney's feed, who's now doing photo dumps, which I've heard is the death of Instagram. Like now that people are doing photo dumps, it's basically kind of what killed Facebook is when people could start doing albums and doing photo dumps in albums. This is now happening on Instagram, where it's not filtered. It's not even good composition. They're not really concerned with how it affects their feed. So I've noticed her doing that where she'll dump just 10 photos of like a parking lot. You know, for example. Okay. Kind of love it, kind of hate it. Yeah. Right. You know, I love an aesthetic. I love a vibe. But I also think that this is the vibe. Like the vibe now is a parking lot. Yeah. Right. It's just kind of being too cool to care about keeping it filtered, keeping it vibey, keeping it on point, on brand, right? right? Mm. But that's becoming the brand. So I do think it is this wave back to authenticity, or it could be the last you know, right. nail in the coffin. We'll see. We'll, <laughs> we'll only see. time will tell. I also am finding that um, I'm really into like Substacks lately mm-hmm. and Patreon. So like – Again, where we're creating content, where we're publishing and distributing content, I'm finding that I'm drawn to content that is more self-published than stuff that's produced by gatekeeping dinosaurs. I shouldn't say dinosaurs. That's rude, right. They might but... even be just gatekeepers, right? Just gatekeeper because, like, I don't see or Spotify being your own gatekeeper. A... Yeah. Right? Make your own rules. You get to decide. You get to make your own rules. And you then own it. Like you own what's coming behind that gate, right? Yeah. And you're being compensated versus the platform being compensated. So I'm really into Substack. I'm really into Patreon. I feel like people are being more themselves than ever. Again, it feels like the early days of blogging, what's happening in newsletters right now, whether that's curated lists Mm. or and feeds or um, more personal essays. So like one of my favorite substacks right now is Kelly Oxford. Do you follow her at all? No, but what is she doing? She's got a newsletter. 
She's got a newsletter now on Substack. I really like it. I follow also quite a few food writers yeah. who have newsletters. And so they're combining stuff like personal writing with recipes. What does that sound oh, like? Oh, it sounds like a 2008 <laughs> Old blogging. school food blog. <laughs> so I, I'm here for it. I love to even going into this evolutionary part of it. I feel like back in the day, those that uh, like you started blogging or that was really kind of the only way to share content. I guess you could do a newsletter, newsletter or a blog back in the day. You were doing that because you just had something you wanted to share. Or even MySpace. Oh, yeah. People were sharing their own music. Like that was an early social media platform that wasn't inundated with advertising. Right. And people were sharing their own content, their own creation. That's funny. I hadn't quite thought of that one. So creating this content, but one of the things that the growing internet has given us is the ability to be paid for it. Like back in the day, you couldn't be paid for a newsletter. No one had figured out how to make that work or pay to blog or whatever it may be or be paid to blog um, by the people who were reading. Exactly. You were being paid for it via opportunities. So you were maybe getting a cookbook deal or you're Lily Allen on MySpace making music and you get a record deal. So it, there is this like it still is going back to traditional media, which is interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. It's like getting paid in traditional ways with this wedge of a non-traditional entrance. Yeah. Yes, for sure. So it's the internet has developed or has given us a way to be paid individually for or be paid by our readers or consumers, I guess, for the content that we're creating. If you're just there to create content, um, these platforms have been built in a way that will allow you to create content for the service of, you know, whatever else you're doing. If you have a service that you're providing or if you're selling a product or whatever it may be. And then there still is, and thank God this has like become more normalized and mainstream, this idea of working with brand partners to create content. Because as I said earlier, back in the day, you were talking to a celebrity if you were talking to someone who was blogging as a sponsored blogger, right? Like that was too cool for school. Um, These days... And if you were trying to get into that, how hard was it? Because so few brands understood that it was beneficial to partner with bloggers back in the day for creating content. I mean, some of us were even faking it, like pretending like (laughs) we were sponsored when in fact we were not. We were just freely selling whatever we liked. Yeah, (laughs) indeed. But now... Almost every large brand has some sort of creator advertising budget, right, for working with bloggers or Instagrammers or podcasters or whatever it may be for for sponsoring content. And so that's been more normalized. However, there's sort of a con to this and that a huge con to it, (laughs) which is that you cannot post without someone asking you where you bought your thing. Oh, yeah, that or you cannot consume Without being sold to. Being sold to. Right? Yeah. One way or the other. selling something. Every Instagram, not every, obviously, asterisk everywhere, everyone, um, but every Instagram, every blog post, every podcast, guilty, like all the things, you consume it, you're going to get sold something. And that, y'all, is Marketing America. And I'll tell you what, I wrestle with it. Back to the performance enhancing drugs. It's like if people are going to be asking me where I buy all my stuff anyway, should I get paid for it? Should I just go ahead and get paid? Or do I move into a cabin in the middle of the woods where I'm not paying taxes and (laughs) growing my own food? And also not wearing really nice shoes. (laughs) I like wildly (laughs) vacillate between the two. Like, should I get paid and basically live like, live like I have a sugar daddy or do I? A big brand sugar daddy. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Or do you just take care of yourself, food and all? Um, Right. I mean, that is kind of the question. It's something that, you know, I stopped doing my personal Instagram years ago um, and just I was burnt out. I didn't want to. I had nothing worth sharing at that point. At least I felt so. Um, And I've had a really hard time picking it back up. But I've actually had the urge to pick it back up later just for the purpose of just sharing something not to sell or to like, you know, fulfill on a contractual 
contractual obligation or any of those things, but just to share something. Am I doing it? No, I have too many other pieces of content I need to create. Um, but, but will we ever just be able to engage with content on the internet in a way that is just purely for fun? Well, what's interesting is that I have used my Instagram in that way. I have yep. never sold anything other than my own stuff. And even then, I rarely share anything about being boss, like whenever I still own being boss or even braid on my personal Instagram, unless it's maybe a design that I'm really proud of. But I've definitely kind of divorced my personal and professional whenever there used to be such a blend and an overlap. I share personally on Instagram and I felt less and less inclined to do it because of the influencer culture and because everyone's selling something. And if you're not being sold to, then you're selling something, right? Or people assuming that I'm selling something. Someone called me an influencer the other day and I was like, <laughs> I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> and that's what it means to be an influencer. Like, great if I'm influencing you to be yourself and to show up as you are and I don't know, whatever, but – even filters, like, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Everyone's putting a filter on their face. And that's influencing the masses to get Botox, which I do. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's influencing <laughs> people to do – like, we're be we're all being influenced. I yeah. don't know that that's the problem. Anyway, I almost want to say, like, cut all that out because I don't even really know what I'm saying no, it's, anymore. It's fine. Just ramble it out. No, I mean, I <laughs> – the the overlap of pros and cons here is never ending, right? Like I, you know, I, I've had the desire to do lately. What? Sorry, I just interrupted no, you. You what? keep going. I don't know what. What do What do you want to do? I know. I want people to know, like whenever whenever a lot of people interrupt each other on podcasts, it's because one, I knew that you weren't necessarily going anywhere with that. <laughs> Two. I'm going to lose it if I don't say it. I've had the urge to just wake up and start writing in the morning again. Oh, yeah. To just write without sharing. Yeah. You know, so like the capturing and shaping part. Yep. Just to even feel like I'm living a life worth living. Like that's what I love about capturing and shaping and sharing is that it helps me punctuate my life with memories mm. so that I feel like I've done something. So I'm not living in a groundhog day of – work and capitalism and parenting and advertising you know algorithms. what I mean all the things yeah. yeah it's exhausting so if I'm just in my own google doc see even I said google doc son of a bitch <laughs> google even google is like infiltrating <laughs> my creative just process. just get a pen and paper Kathleen pen and paper I will say I am not sharing on Instagram, but I have started taking photos again in a way that I haven't since before burnout. Because and similarly, we're like, I don't want to share it, but I do want to capture. I want to remember. I want to, you know, keep this catalog of of memories like I used to. I used to be so great about just sort of taking really cool photos. And it always gave me like I knew I was living a beautiful life because literally it was like right there in my photo feed, right? Not overly edited. Some filters, of course, you got to really balance those colors out. But um, but that for me was always just such a treat to look back and see this proof that like I am living what I love, right? And so I have gotten back to taking photos again. I'm not sharing them. I have nowhere to put them. Not Probably not going to, but they're there for me. And I will say I've taken much joy from that. You know, this this really has me thinking just about maybe this episode is actually just about creativity, you know, and it really mm -hmm. is about we don't have to monetize everything. We don't need a deal. We don't need we don't need other people to give us permission. You know, like so for example, I do is in fact, whenever you do, that's when things get sticky. Yeah. Right? That is totally if you are tying the content that you're creating to your brand. Oh my God. Literally the number of small business small local businesses that I have not bought from because they take their personal antics to their business accounts, like they're creating their personal content on those business accounts. Like I'm not supporting your business just because you've just shared, just because you did it, not even what your opinion is, but because you crossed that line. Um, and also probably the opinion, but I, I completely disagree with this because <laughs> on can. the flip side, I love supporting content creators who I know that their personal values align with mine. So mm. there is the flip side to that. Like whenever people are sharing that 
they're a small family or that they're into social justice initiatives or that they are, you know, like one of my favorite restaurants here in Detroit, Baobab, like, you know, it's a family that came from Africa and they're just trying to share their food with Detroit, you know, like, yes, yeah. I want to hear about where you're from and I want to support you because of who you are and your food is delicious, right? <laughs> so I do love a blend. I love a blend. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing if you're an asshole. So now I know not to support you. <laughs> and that. And that. I don't – it's something that just sort of grinds my gears. I can't do it. But I think, like, when you are creating content in conjunction with some sort of money-making situation – right? Whatever that may be. That's when things get sticky. I think there is this purity to just showing up and creating content for the sake of creating content and sharing whatever it is that you're wanting to share, um, which is kind of where this evolution of things is 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 happening, right? Where this is why I want to come back to being boss all the time <laughs> without being an owner of it. I'm like, can I just come on to be yeah, boss just- and shoot the shit with you? And podcast without having zero responsibility for making money for this thing. So that responsibility or piece. I don't even want to get paid. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, the responsibility piece I feel is one of the biggest sort of points of evolution of content creation. How we have all started taking money for the content we create in one way or another is that now there is a pile of responsibility that we all have to take for it. Right. And whether like, do you know the business ethics and practices of those shoes that you're wearing or that lip gloss that you just shared or, you know, whatever the deal that you just made with the brand? Who knows? All the and things. it's also like, oh, my God, to what end? I know. So I might really <laughs> like the way that Nike aligns itself with Colin Kaepernick, for example. But are they paying their assistants I mean, well? <laughs> exactly. Like, I may not love – like, I think that there have been some questionable production practices. I know that there have yeah. been. Right? You know, so it's like, to what end? I remember – I think I've even shared this on the podcast before, being called out whenever I shared a recipe once that had quinoa in it. And someone was like, well, what about the exploitation of the quinoa farmers? And I was like, oh, my God, I cannot be perfect in my consumption of all the things. Because guess what? There's a problem with everything. Absolutely everything. Especially if you're looking for it. So earlier, that actually makes me – reminds me, you know, I just want to be more enthusiastic about sharing the things that I love than – being negative or critical about the things that I hate. That's something that's really come out of the past couple of years Mm. for me, both in what I'm creating and what I'm consuming, because I found myself falling into a very dark place of cynicism and negativity because there's a lot to be mad about in the world. And trust me, I am mad about it, but I am poisoning myself whenever it's completely consuming how I show up as a creative and I cannot show up that way anymore, which means I don't want to talk about Spotify. <laughs> Except you did. Not anymore. I know. We did it. Do you know what yes, I mean? Yes, 100%. I did, it. I did it. But I guess that's just to illustrate that I'm concerned about these things. I'm thinking about these things. But I still want to create, I want to be a creative and I want to consume creative through the lens of okay, where's the good? Where's the good and where can I elevate the good and where can I create the good? And where can I share this with people who see it, who see the good? That's sort of where I want to take this next is one of the ways that content creation has evolved over the past decade plus is that before you could You had a MySpace, a live journal, whatever it may be. There was a blog. At some point, you could be on Facebook and then Twitter and then YouTube and then and then and then and then and then and then, then, right? And now we have all of these options. And it's not just a small group of like tech savvy creatives on in this space anymore. It's your aunts and your uncles and your weird neighbor down the street. And literally every single person has access to this content. And so what I see a lot of people doing, and you should be if you're not already, is leaving the masses to go find the places where you feel great creating the content that you were here to create, sharing whatever it is, whether it's all of the affiliate links for every book that you've ever read because you are a total bookworm 
or you are sharing content around the thing that you are creating and selling, or you are just like purely sharing some stories that you've written or your opinions on some political shit that needs your opinion shared, whatever it may be. One of the ways that I see the internet evolving that I really love is people just showing up with their people in those like little finite places. And so maybe that is behind a paywall, right? Maybe it is a Patreon or a Substack, or for us, it's the Being Boss community. I'm not on Instagram. I'm lightly on Twitter because I think it's a funny place sometimes. Um, but you know where I'm You're showing not up? even in your text messages. I'm not even I in my even... text message. Fact. <laughs> fact. <laughs> I've got to Marco Polo you if I want to get a hold of you, which is actually interesting. Right. So, like I cannot text you, but I can Marco Polo you. <laughs> I am religious with my Marco Polos. I will not look at my text messages for weeks, <laughs> for weeks and weeks. Um, so you find the places, but like also, isn't that even like a a cause of what we're I have 14 apps on my phone that I have people coming at me in every day. Right. So I have the one or two places where I am engaging. And that's what I see other people doing as well. I think, you know, at being boss is definitely the community. That's where I am. I'm not I'm not in my Instagram lives or like doing reels or any of those things. I'm showing up in the community and I love it there. I was sharing with a friend the other day. I was like, because y'all, I have opinions. <laughs> y'all hear me getting heated over here. I have so many opinions and things that I feel like I need to say. I'm not going to share most of it here on the podcast. It's too big. Plain and simple. I'm just not going to. Um, I can't tweet it (laughs) because that's a shitstorm. A hundred percent. I've seen it all happen. Um, But I do have small groups of people, whether it's in the community or in the C-suite or my Marco Polo groups or whatever it may be, that I'm sharing those things. And and I feel like that's even sort of another point of evolution in that because everyone is here on the internet consuming all the things, you're getting opinions from every single side. If you want to create content and just feel good about it and not spend the rest of your life fielding every sort of incoming issue, find your place. You don't need to be everywhere. You just need to find the place where you can access your people and share what you want to share. And on the flip side of that, I would say you don't have to be consuming everything. This has been revelatory for me that I don't have to be on every platform. I don't have to listen to every podcast. You can pick and choose. You know, so maybe go through your Instagram feed and unfollow the things that don't make you feel good or that don't inspire you. You can still use these platforms that are even problematic like Instagram or Spotify or whatever to consume the stuff that makes you feel good, that inspires you, that inspires you to create your own content. You can pick up a book. You can read it. You can curate your own bookshelf. You know, so I would just say think about the consumption side of things as well as someone who consumes a lot of media um, and a lot of content. It's really important to protect your energy and to protect your own space and like what's happening inside your own brain by being careful about what you're putting in there. This actually reminds me of an exercise in the Being Boss book, Kathleen. Right. Um, In, I think, the mindset or maybe boundaries. Actually, I think it's in the boundaries chapter. We talk about what gives you energy and what drains your energy. I think if anyone is sort of experiencing the situation where like you're getting sucked into Instagram, right, or you have a pile of books that you really want to get to, but you can't quite make the time or whatever it may be, sit down and make a list of when it comes to content creation and content consumption, what gives you energy and what drains you energy or what drains your energy. And I think if you can just literally put it in those like sort of binary terms in that way of like, this is making me feel great and this is making me feel like shit, you can gain so much clarity around where you're showing up. Um, I can't consume podcasts, y'all. I can't. I try. I try all the time. I will load up a queue, get in the car, and like someone just starts talking at me whenever I could have a little bit of brain space, and I can't even. How do y'all listen to me? (laughs) I don't get it. Right, but I will read a book all day long. And part of the reason why I don't listen to podcasts is because I'm prioritizing reading books. 
And so just like you would prioritize anything in your life, your marketing efforts, where you need to spend your time tomorrow, um, whatever, what you want to eat for dinner, you can do the same thing with where you are creating and consuming content so that you can show up in the places that you want to show up and you can learn or, you know, feel engaged in whatever ways you most learn and feel engaged. That's all I've got. (laughs) I think Kathleen's done. (laughs) I'm done. <laughs> this was not, you know, it's just funny because like I feel like this was not a perfect conversation, but it's it's a podcasting conversation. Right. It's about it's it's what's on our mind. It's about it's about a way of doing that we both feel passionately about. Right? Like we have both been mm. we you've literally we've both literally created careers around this idea of capturing, shaping, and sharing, right, content, um, there has been... And we've gotten paid in lots of different ways for it, too. So many ways. Interesting. Yep. Lots of different opportunities, lots of different outcomes, some good, some bad. Lots of good. Failures. You know, it, as, I'm do, as we're talking about this, I'm, I keep the image of rolling a 20-sided die for any of you d d <gasps> nerds Damn. out there. Okay. It's almost like rolling, you know, this huge dice. And I feel like we're touching on like one facet mm-hmm. of this dice to be on brand, maybe like a crystal, you know, sure. like a crystal. <laughs> rolling the crystal we're on one facet it's one side of it right and you could turn it different ways and see see all of it through a different lens right so that's why this conversation feels imperfect because there's no right or there's no right way to create content or to consume content you just have to consider it and look at it from different angles and be intentional. That's all we're asking is just to put a little bit more thought into it, into how you're creating and how you're consuming and do what's right for you. Yes. I think actually that intention piece is sort of the underlying thread throughout this entire thing, right? I think intention was missing or misaligned throughout the entire Spotify Joe Rogan situation, for sure. I think I think that is a given. And I think that's why things have landed sort of where they are. I am so interested to see what happens over the 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 rest of his contract terms because it's not forever, y'all. He'll be off of Spotify at some point. Um, and so like intention, I think, was missing, has probably been missing for years of podcasting. Um, for us, I believe that is what has always sort of given us a leg up is we have been so intentional with what we've created and how we've shown up. And we're teaching you guys how to do the same. And I think as the world of content creation just continues to expand and open, which kind of blows my mind, because whenever I think about how expansive it is now, compared to where it was 15 years ago, like, my brain can't hold it. It's wild to me. So whenever I think about what happens next, y'all the metaverse, (laughs) still get me tickled on that one. Um, But it is intention that I think is going to keep us all from losing our shit along the way and like losing our collective shit as like humans showing up in this sort of brave new world. Um, I I'm still here. I love it. I love creating content. I love thinking about content and curating it and creating it and sharing it with all of you. But also just generally know that I also think we've been able to do what we do because we are filtering and editing and doing things through the lens of our values. And that's what makes me feel good about the work that we do. Even if we show up with hiccups, I we know how to like um, make amends and follow through because the intentions are there. And that makes me think about it, it, with every coaching and consulting session that I do, whenever one of my clients is having an issue, it's because they feel like they should be doing something versus loving doing it. Mm. Like they feel like they should write and publish a book versus loving writing it. Like we loved writing our book together, right? We never felt like this should be something that we aspire to. We started a podcast because we love talking to each other and I love podcasts. I love consuming them. I love creating them. Um, So let that be a driving factor. Like if you don't entirely know what your values are, just if you love doing it, let that be enough. And if you don't love doing it, let that be enough of a reason to stop. 
Yeah, for sure. Otherwise, go create some content. (laughs) Join in one way or the other. But I love the idea of doing it through the lens of what you love for sure. Because I I don't love consuming them, but I do love creating podcasts a ton, a ton. Me too. Perfect. Kathleen, this has been a treat. It's always so good to join you on the show. I'm glad that you were like, let's, let's, I don't want to talk about it, but let's talk about it. It has been an interesting lesson. (laughs) And let's record it and publish it. (laughs) All right. Then last, but definitely never least, what's making you feel most boss these days? I'm having a rough day. I do not feel boss at all. I feel so scattered and disjointed and grumpy. So what's making me feel boss? Um, may I may I um, offer up yeah, that tracksuit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my tracksuit, my matchy matchy tracksuit is making me feel like a different kind of boss. There's like some some like Golden Girls vibe happening here too. Yeah, which is okay, real great. Yeah, it's the Sopranos meets Golden Girls. <laughs> I love I like it. it. It's a great outfit. That's making me feel boss. Yeah. You did a good job. Um, no, okay. So what's making me feel boss? Probably my morning yoga practice. Mm-hmm. I feel so goopy saying that. Yeah. But just centering myself, bringing my thoughts and energy back into my body makes me feel boss. Love How that. about you? What's making you feel boss lately? Um, well, hope tomorrow I will find out if I'm actually boss at this. But I recently negotiated a lease and like showing That's up. That's the secret that you couldn't talk about last It is time. the secret that I could. And I may not be able to talk about it yet. I shouldn't really probably be talking about it. By the time this goes live, it'll be a done deal, I'm sure. Um, but I felt really boss last week whenever I showed up and negotiated a lease that I would have just signed. It was not a bad lease by any means, but... I also just laid out what I wanted and I find out tomorrow just how boss my bossness was. But regardless of the outcome, it felt boss to just show up and negotiate. I love it. Yeah. And now you're going to have like another space, like your eighth space. <laughs> 47, I think, by last count. <laughs> That feels balls too. More space um, for commercial leases once we sign this one, at least for the moment. And we'll either let one go or add four more. We'll see. All right, boss, because you're here, I know you want to be a better creative business owner, which means I've got something for you. Each week, the team at Being Boss is scouring the news, the best entrepreneurial publications, and updates and releases of the apps and tools that run our businesses, and is curating it all into a weekly email that delivers the must-know tips and tactics in the realms of mindset, money, and productivity. This email is called Brood. We brew it up for you each week to give you the insight you need to make decisions and move forward in your creative business. Check it out now and sign up for yourself at beingboss.club slash brood. That's beingboss.club slash B-R-E-W-E-D. Now, until next time, do the work, be boss. Yeah.